Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, it is our Open Championship 2023 DFS preview. We're going to be breaking down all things DraftKings and FanDuel related for the Open Championship 2023 at Royal Liverpool Golf Club. We're going to be talking my favorite plays, my fades, ownership, leverage, pivots, lineup construction, all that stuff. We're going to be breaking it down here on this episode, helping you construct the best lineup possible um, for the Open Championship 2023. Now, if you missed yesterday's episode, which was our course preview episode where we took a look at Royal Liverpool Golf Club and just kind of broke down how some of the holes play out, what type of golf um, succeeds here, some of the comp courses, and what types of golfers should succeed here. We talked all that on yesterday's episode. Link is in the description on YouTube. Um, it is in the podcast feed if you're listening to audio form. I highly recommend going and checking that one out before you watch this one. But hey, if you just want to jump straight into DFS, um, then this is the right place to be. So anyway... But that that really is all the introduction we needed. It's Open Championship Week, y'all. Golf's going to be on at 2.30 a.m. Thursday morning. Let's go ahead and break it down. Let's go ahead and figure out how we can set our lineups to be the best lineup possible for the Open Championship. So let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so first things first, we got to talk about this semi-controversial DraftKings pricing that we got this week. Um, if you have played DraftKings golf for years like I have, I started way back in 2015, this is like more – old school DraftKings pricing where you've got a little bit more of a stratification between the very top of the field and the very bottom of the field. This week, we've got Scotty Scheffler up at $12,500, which is the most I have seen somebody in a non-tour championship event in since like 2015. And in 2015, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't paying that super much attention um, to the pricing at that point. I was just playing the guys that I liked, just playing willy-nilly, and it actually kind of worked out without putting a whole lot of thought into it. Um, like the 2015 Masters, I just played Spieth and Mickelson and just kind of went with the rest of the lineup from there. And those ended up being like the top two guys that week. Anyway, that's beside the point. So we do have different pricing this week. And I got to admit, I'm kind of a fan of it on DraftKings. I, I really am. Um, I think that the way they set it up, I think they made it um, a little bit more options in terms of lineup construction, because I think it really is going to benefit you this week if you go down to the very bottom and happen to get one of those guys that you know makes the cut and, and has a good weekend, maybe gives you a top 20, top 10 finish. That's going to be how you win your GPPs this week. It's not going to be because you, just because you had Scotty or Rory and they won. And I got to be honest, I think with the way that it's set up, I think you can actually play Scotty and Rory in the same lineup. It's not impossible. If you were to go on DraftKings and put Scotty and Rory into the same lineup, you'd have an average salary remaining of $6,400, which is absolutely doable considering that the bare minimum is $5,500. You can go down, play a guy from that 5K range, and then you're right back into the upper sixes, low sevens for your remaining three golfers. Now on FanDuel, the pricing is more normal for FanDuel standards. you got Scotty and Rory in the 12K range, and it all kind of goes down very linearly from that point. Linearly? Linear? Yeah, I think I said that right. Very linearly from that point um, until you get down to the $7,000 minimum. Now, it, on FanDuel, I think it's very easy to play both Scheffler and Rory um, because you just – just you know, dive in a little bit further for the values um, after that. But I think that playing Scheffler and Rory is absolutely a viable strategy on both sides. And if you look at the most recent tournaments, we're looking at the cheat sheet here on RickRunGood.com. If you look at the Scottish Open, if you look at the Travelers, you look at the U.S. Open, if you had just hypothetically jammed in uh, Scotty and Rory into those lineups, as long as you kind of found a six for six, if you found guys at the bottom that made the cut, it could have really worked out well for you. And I definitely think that that's an option this week is to go with both of them. Now, like I said, I'm probably going to play both of them. I, I don't know if I'm actually going to have a whole lot of lineups with both of them in the same lineup, but I do think I'm going to play both of them this week because I do think they're the two best options. Now, another strategy that I do want to talk about, I talked about kind of the diversification of lineups that DraftKings is allowing for with that bare minimum salary being at 5,500. If you were to go with Scheffler and Kepka as your first two guys in, Kepka being the fifth highest price guy on the board, it gives you 6,800 average remaining, which means that you could just go one guy from the low sixes or upper fives, and you'd be able to play the rest of your lineup for $7,000 and above. So I do think that there's a lot of options this week, and you can really get creative at the top by using two of these different guys up near the very top. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, wait a minute, well, I don't want to play both Scheffler and Rory. I want to, you know, pick just one and go with it. Well, let's see if we can make the case for just one of these guys. Like I said, I like both of them. I would, I think both of them by far had the most win equity to win this tournament. 
So if you're looking at Scotty Scheffler's profile, he is quite simply the best tee to green golfer in the world. He has gained double digit strokes tee to green in seven straight events. That's absolutely insane. He hasn't come outside of fifth place in seven straight events. And all the while, he's had some truly terrible outings with the putter. I just think that his tee to green game is so good right now that no matter how good or how bad the putter is, he's going to put himself in contention on Sunday. And his major championship record has actually been deceptively good, even though he only has the one win at the Masters. This year, he had a T10 at Augusta where the only thing that went wrong for him was the putter, and then T2 at Oak Hill, and then third place outright at Los Angeles Country Club. I just think everything points to Scotty Scheffler being the golfer with the absolute highest floor this week. Um, I would be highly shocked if he does not come in the top 10. Like if you're looking to make a top 10 bet, uh, I think that's the safest one out there. I'd be surprised if the odds weren't like minus 500 on that. All right, now let's make the case for Roy McIlroy. So Roy McIlroy is obviously coming off of the very emotional win at the Scottish Open. He's been playing really good golf for like the last month and a half as well. He's gained at least six strokes TD Green in his last six events, dating back to the Wells Fargo Championship. So another guy like Scotty who is just doing it all very well. And in those last six stars, he has not finished worse than ninth place. Now, one thing that I do really like about Rory is that at the start of the year when he was in his slump, he was not putting very well, like, at all. But ever since the Wells Fargo Championship, he's been really good with the putter. He's gained strokes putting in those six straight events. Um, I had just doing some research. I'd heard he'd been working with Brad Faxon on his putting, who is one of the best clutch putters of all time. Um, so I absolutely think that that is something that has been helping him and the results have paid off. Now, do not think that just because he won the Scottish Open that, oh, you know, guys don't win back-to-back. -back. They don't win majors the week before, da 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 Like, that's absolutely a thing that can happen. Phil Mickelson back in 2013 won the Scottish Open and then won the Open Championship at Muirfield. So it is something that can happen. But the bottom line with Scotty and Rory is you're getting the two best TD Green players in the world who both have the capability of getting hot with the putter, and they both shown the ability that even when the putter is not there, the rest of their game is clicking to a degree that it doesn't even matter. I really like both Scotty and Rory this week. Now we got to go ahead and talk about John Rahm. So John Rahm is the third highest priced golfer on the board. And I'm not going to lie to you. I kind of feel like more often than not, Rahm's in the top two. He's not very often sitting at third, but I think he's absolutely at the right spot. And I got to be honest with you. If you're looking at projected ownership right now, rickrungood.com has John Rahm at 18.6%, which is significantly lower than Scotty and Rory. I think that if you're an ownership type of guy in DFS, you got to play John Rahm, right? Because he's going to be the guy up there that's going to, you know, be by far the least owned. But if you're a narrative player, if you are a um, a data type of player, I don't think you can play John Rahm. You know, he won the Masters in April, which he was absolutely outstanding. It was just a great exhibition of four rounds of golf. He was in the bad weather wave and he still won. Props to him for that. But he hasn't been great since then. He came in second in Mexico, which was one of the weakest fields of the year. And then he really hasn't done much since. At Mirfield Village, one of his favorite courses, he lost five strokes putting and was T16. Los Angeles Country Club, he gained in all four categories, but never really put it together. And then at TBC River Highlands, he was very mediocre through two days and missed the cut. So I kind of think John Rahm is going through what a lot of guys go through, which is just kind of that post-Masters lull, where just after you win the Masters, that kind of is like the crescendo of your year. It's really hard to get back up for the rest of the tournaments after you put on that green jacket. And... I don't know if I'm going to full fade John Rahm, but I'm definitely not going to be as exposed to him as I am Rory and Scotty, just because I think Rory and Scotty are much more rock steady players and rock solid in terms of what you're going to get from him. And John Rahm's open championship history is not great either. Um, you know, ever since he started playing regularly in 2016, um, he's missed one cut, uh, but he only has one top 10 finish. That was at Royal St. George's. I don't know if his temperament um, sets himself up for being a great player at Open Championships, just being a guy who's fiery, plays off of emotion, whereas Lynx Golf, you're going to have bad bounces, you're going to have bad breaks, you're just going to have to be like steady mentally. I don't think that that is the best setup for John Rahm. So looking down at the next little tier, um, so, so far, to recap, I'm probably going to be overweight on Scotty Scheffler and Roy McIlroy and underweight on John Rahm. The next two guys are kind of like the prizes of Live Golf, Cameron Smith and Brooks Kepka. I'm probably going to be playing a lot of both of them. So um, if we want to talk about Cam Smith, right? 
Um, thinking about what we know about Cam Smith, first off, he is the defending champion of the Open. He won last year at St. Andrews. And I think that the contest that you play in is going to dictate his ownership because I think a lot of casuals in, that are playing in low-dollar DFS contests are going to look at Cam Smith and say, oh, he's the defending champ. Oh, he's coming off of the win at Live London. He, you know, He's a great play. Lock him in. But you're seeing a lot of people in the DFS industry this week kind of um, – cautioning or you know kind of words of caution about cam smith because yes he can be a little wild off the tee yes his fairways and regulation and his greens and regulation were very low at live london but that's kind of okay if you remember from yesterday's episode one of my comp courses was um, tpc sawgrass and when you look last year at what he did at tpc sawgrass you know tbc sawgrass has a lot of one-way misses off the tee where you just cannot miss left or right because it's water. Well, at Royal Liverpool, it's going to be you cannot miss left or right because of out of bounds. Cam Smith lost five strokes off the tee at that event and still won it by two strokes. How? He was the best player in the field on approach. He was the best player in the field on the greens, and that was his path to doing it. If you look at the Open Championship that he won last year, he was very mediocre off the tee. He was good on approach. He was elite on the greens. That's kind of the formula for Cam Smith. He's not going to be the highest fairway in greens guy, He, but he's going to put the lights out, and he's going to be a good approach player. So I'm willing to buy back in on Cam Smith. Another guy that I'm willing to buy back in on is Brooks Kepka, but kind of for the opposite reason. Brooks Kepka is the fairways and greens guy. He is one of the most conservative course managers out there, and he is totally willing to you know hit to the middle of the green, try to make his birdie putt, if not two putt for par, and move on to the next hole. And I think that strategy can serve him very well here. It's kind of how Tiger Woods won in 2006, where he was clubbing down a lot. He was playing very conservatively, and he played most of the last two rounds with a lead. I, I could kind of see Brooks Kepka doing the same thing. A lot of other things that people don't know about Brooks Kepka is he actually started his career on the DP World Tour and on the Challenge Tour, which is like their version of the Corn Ferry Tour over there. So he has experience playing Lynx golf, uh, and he's been pretty comfortable at Open Championships. T6 at Royal Birkdale, T4 at Royal Port Rush, 6th at Royal St. George's in 2021. Last year he missed the cut, but he was very clearly injured. Um, so I'm willing to write that off, and I'm willing to play a lot of Cam Smith and Brooks Kepka this week. I just think they're going to be good plays. Xander Shoffley, I'm not intrigued by at all, quite frankly. Um, but I do want to talk about Victor Hovland. So Victor Hovland is the guy that I'm just going to keep playing him in majors because he just keeps showing up in majors. And I think he's eventually going to win one. And so why would I not just keep playing the guy that I think is going to win one eventually and just hope that, you know, this is the time that he wins one. But you look at what he's done in the last four majors, T4 at St. Andrews, T7 at Augusta, T2 at Oak Hill, 19th at Los Angeles Country Club. What I really like about Victor Hovland though, is in his win at Mirfield Village, he kind of played a different strategy from the victor that we had known previously. He played more like Brooks Kepka. What do I mean by that? It was fairway green, fairway green, very conservative course management instead of just firing away at every pin and trying to rely on his short game. His short game's not his strength. Is he if he's able to take this conservative approach and hit fairways and hit greens, I really do like Victor Hovland's chances at winning this tournament. He's another guy that I'm willing to be overweight to the field on. Now, Patrick Cantlay is another guy that I was really hoping the ownership was going to be lower. It's not very high sitting at 10.8%, but I definitely thought the ownership would be a little bit lower than this, especially coming off of the mixed cut at the Renaissance Club. But if you look at the numbers, it was really just all in the short game at the Renaissance Club that cost him. Um, and I really think that um, his ball striking has been there. It was still there at Renaissance Club. So I do think that he's going to have the opportunity to continue being a good ball striker and to continue to kind of put himself in contention. You know, we talked about yesterday also, one of my um, course comparisons being Harbor Town. Well, he's been absolutely elite at Harbor Town. He's been third and second in the last two iterations of that tournament. Now, people also like to rag on um, Patrick Cantlay's major history. Well, he's been pretty good in the last five. He was 14th at last year's U.S. Open, T8th at last year's Open, and then T14, T9, T14 this year. That's pretty solid. If you play him on DraftKings, that is more than getting your money's worth um, if he just gives you another T8 or T14. I don't know if he's necessarily going to win the tournament. I don't think he has that same upside that Victor Hovland does in terms of winning, but I do really like the fact that his ball striking is still there, and I like the fact that people are going to be a little bit off of him because of their short game woes. 
Now, Ricky Fowler and Jordan Spieth, I was kind of surprised to see the ownership projected as low on them as they are because people love playing Ricky. But I guess everybody's just looking at the fact that Ricky got his win at the Rocket Mortgage, kind of like what happened to Jason Day where he got his win at the Byron Nelson and just nothing has gone right since. Um, and people appear to be fading him for that reason. But Ricky does have a very good open championship history. I'm willing to play Ricky. Jordan Spieth. Guy coming in in absolutely terrible form off two straight missed cuts, but his open championship history is absolutely elite. In the last five iterations of this tournament, he has not finished worse than 20th. And I got to be honest, he's had very mediocre form coming into some of those opens as well. He's just a great Lynx golf player, um, and I have no problem going to Jordan Spieth. Now, the other guy in the 9K range that I do want to talk about is Tommy Fleetwood. So, Tommy Fleetwood is playing some very good golf and just has not paid it off with a win. Arguably should have paid it off with a win at the RBC Canadian Open, but he was second at that event, tied for fifth at the U.S. Open uh, the next week, and then tied for sixth at the Renaissance Club last week. And really that could have been better. I believe he doubled the last hole. Um, which went from T3 to T6 just like that. Um, but I really do like what he's doing. The ball striking numbers have been very good. He's also been a guy that has just kind of been lurking around in majors, constantly sniffing around the top of the leaderboard. Um, and I do think that this is a very good opportunity for him to break through and finally get one. And his Open Championship history is very good as well. Second at Royal Port Rush in 2019. Uh, fourth at St. Andrews last year. I, I really like what he's done at Open Championships. I think he's a good Lynx golfer. I have no problem going back to Tommy Fleetwood. Now, the last guy in the 9K range that I do need to talk about is Shane Lowry. So as I mentioned on the U.S. Open podcast, if you remember um, that one from about a month ago, Shane Lowry is just kind of one of those, like, duh, guys in a major like of course i'm turning this on on sunday and shane lowry's like in 10th place in a major duh that's what he does right he seems to always show up at majors he's a great links golfer um, I have no problem going to Shane Lowry. Just know that his ownership does project to be a little bit high um, because I do think, you know, with him being one of the lower guys in the 9K range, I think he's going to be a guy that a lot of people click to um, for that reason. But if you look at what he did at the Scottish Open, he did it with a lot of around the green play. I would have really preferred his ball striking to be a little bit better. But, hey, he's a guy who excels at Lynx Golf. He's a guy who excels at major championships. All right, so that does it for the 10, or I guess the 12, 11, 10 and 9K ranges. Let's go ahead and take a quick breather before we dive into the 8K. All right, so while we're talking about the AK range, this seems like as good a time ever to bring this up because we're looking at Bryson DeChambeau's name on the board. So we really don't know how, exactly how this tournament is going to play, right? We know what the course looks like. We know it's going to be Lynx golf. We don't know if it's going to be super firm and fast. We don't know if the conditions are going to be soft. We don't know if... Um, it's going to be super windy, calm, rainy, whatever, right? So one thing you can do to kind of offset that is to play guys that if the course plays a certain way, they're instantly in the top 10 of, you know, like that type of mold, right? So one thing like looking back at the last two iterations of the Open here at Hoylake is you had Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy win, two very long off the tee golfers, Tiger long off the tee, but he used a driving iron to hit more fairways. Rory long off the tee, but he used a driver and in soft conditions kept it in the fairway. Well, if long drivers, you know, whether they're clubbing down or whether they are going full-blown driver, if good driving of the golf ball is going to reward you, Bryson DeChambeau is a guy that is probably going to be a guy that should be in your lineup, right? One thing I really like that he did in his runner-up finish at Live Valderrama is he used driving iron off the tee a lot. That was a very short and narrow golf course, and he was able to hit a lot of fairways by using driving iron off the tee. I also think that he's smart and calculated enough of a course management guy that he's not going to take on the out of bounds and risk having to re-tee with shot three. I think he's smart enough and okay enough with a one-way miss um, that he can kind of plan out what he's going to do off the tee. And I really do think that might be a good setup for Bryson DeChambeau. Um, other examples of um, – like what I was just talking about, where if the golf course plays a certain type of way, um, it, you know, it favors certain guys. If it turns into an absolute iron fest where approach is what matters, Scotty Scheffler, Cam Smith, Colin Morikawa, those would be the guys that you want. Victor Hovland, I'd throw in there as well. If it gets super rainy, super windy, terrible conditions, then I would want um, 
I would want Tyrrell Hatton. I would want Shane Lowry. I would want Tommy Fleetwood. I would want the guys that excel at links golf, right? So one thing you can do when you construct your lineups is you kind of have that in mind where, okay, if the course does end up playing this type of way, you know, this guy has a very clear and very easy path to success, right? So looking at the AK range, one guy who I think is actually like proof to that is Wyndham Clark. So Wyndham Clark has been deceptively elite for like this entire calendar year. And nobody really wanted to admit it until he won the U.S. Open. And when you look at what he's been doing, he's just been an absolute elite ball striker. More often than not, he's really good off the tee. More often than not, he's really good with approach. More often than not, he gains strokes with the putter. Now, does he have weeks where one of those categories falter? Yes, but when he puts it all together, what happens? He wins, like he did at the U.S. Open, like he did at Quail Hollow. I also really like the fact that he came in 25th at the Renaissance Club. He's had back-to-back -back good showings at the Renaissance Club. That shows that he's able to play good, solid links golf, and I'm able to trust him for that reason. He did make the cut last year at St. Andrews, um, but he came in T76, lost seven strokes putting. Um, so I'm kind of willing to write that one off. But I do like the fact that, you know, he's in his three links golf appearances in his career, he's made all three cuts. Um, and I do think that his TD Green game has been very, very solid. Wyndham Clark will probably be one of my favorites in the 8K range for that reason. Sam Burns was kind of a victim of bad luck at the Scottish Open. That 19th could have very easily been 10th. Um, if you are any kind of expert at golf Twitter, you probably saw the shot where he wanted to get relief from a bunker where it was kind of not really embedded, but it was kind of just in the um, – the lining of the, the the side of the wall of the bunker it was really strange. Um, and that cost him like instantly three shots. Um, and he is a guy that he does seem to fare well at links golf. Um, I kind of wouldn't mind going to Sam Burns for that reason. But um, one other guy I want to talk about the AK range is Tony Finau. Um, his game is absolutely broken right now, at least from the outside looking in. That is what it appears. He's been just bleeding strokes in all areas, just hasn't really figured it out. But his open championship resume is outstanding. Um, and if it looks like ownership is going to be down on him for that reason, I'm absolutely okay to go to him. In the last five Opens he's played in, he's, he's never finished worse than 28th. He's never missed a cut at an Open Championship. I really do like Tony Finau for that reason. But my favorite play in the 8K range is going to be little Tom Kim. All right? Tom Kim has a deceptively good record at Lynx courses so far in his young career. He was T6 at Renaissance Club. Um, last week, last year, he was third at the Renaissance Club again, and then he made the cut at St. Andrews. He was T47, and he actually did not lose strokes in a single category in either the first appearance at the Renaissance Club or his made cut at St. Andrews. Now, what I really like about Tom Kim is that he was T6 at the Renaissance Club, and he lost strokes off the tee. The rest of his game is so good that even if he's not perfect with the driver, even if he's not hitting every fairway, he's able to recover. He's sound enough in all of his other areas that he can kind of plug the holes, right? Now, obviously, the missed cut at Detroit Golf Club was not ideal, but I, that's a totally different environment than what you're going to see this week at the Open Championship. And, and I really like the fact that Tom Kim heading into this event, he's been really good on approach in three of four. He's been really good putting in two of four. I, I just really like his chances to give a good ceiling week this week here at the Open Championship. And I think ownership's going to be a little down on it. Now, heading down below the 8K range and looking at the 7Ks, there are two guys that immediately come to my mind in the upper 7Ks, the first of which is Corey Connors, who is coming off of a T19 finish at the Renaissance Club. And when you look at it, he really didn't do that great in the ball striking categories at the Renaissance Club. Like three, gaining 3.25 strokes ball striking is well below Corey Connors' average. But what he did do is he actually putted well. We talked about this last week on the Scottish Open preview, but these fescue greens that you see over in the British Isles, they can kind of favor guys who aren't typically good with the putter because they're a little bit slower. The reads are a little less severe. They, it kind of just works out that way. And if he's able to gain two strokes putting this week like he did last week, and he's able to give like a ceiling ball striking performance like he has more often this year, I really think this sets up really well for Corey Connors. He's a guy kind of like we talked about with Brooks Kepka. He's going to be fairway green, fairway fairway green, fairway green. I think that sets up really well for him. I really like Corey Connors this week. Another guy that I really like this week is Minwoo Lee. So Minwoo Lee kind of disappointed over the weekend at the Scottish Open. He was in a much better position on Friday than he finished on Sunday. I, I'll kind of 
give that a little bit to the weather. I don't think he dealt with the weather exactly very well, um, which could kind of be a red flag if the weather is going to be bad this weekend. But anyway, I, I do like where his game's at. He gains strokes off the tee pretty much every week. He gains strokes with the putter pretty much every week. And when you look at what he's done in majors, he tends to really show up in majors like for a guy as young as he is he has really shown up in the last two years at majors um he's missed two cuts in the last two years at majors but 14th at augusta 27th at the country club 21st at st andrews last year 18th at oak hill and fifth at los angeles country club earlier this year i I just really like where his game's at i think he's got a really high ceiling he can really get hot if you're playing showdown dfs or if you are going on underdog and doing the single round drafts he's a guy that i would draft very highly in those because he does have the potential of giving you spike rounds by the way if you plan on going in on underdog use my promo code mconley88 you'll get your first deposit matched up to 100 dollars. but i I just really like what where all of his game is i like the fact that he has a high ceiling i think this bodes really well for minwoo lee and the ownership looks to be fairly down on minwoo lee this week because everybody's opting to play connors or bradley now continuing down with the rest of the 7k range there are two guys that i like at 7300 dollars actually three guys that i like at 7300 dollars now it's looking like right now more of the ownership is going to go to denny mccarthy which i totally understand he's coming off of four straight top 20 finishes three of which were top seven. Um, In those four finishes, he's been pretty good in the ball striking categories. He's been elite with the putter. That's what Denny does, right? Denny is one of the best putters on planet Earth. Now, when you look at his track record in majors, it's actually been deceptively good as well. Last four tries in majors, 48th at Southern Hills, 7th at the Country Club, 29th at Oak Hill, 20th at LACC. There's just, he's kind of always just kind of sniffing around the leaderboard at majors. And if he does that again, you're going to be in good shape playing Denny. Now, another thing I mentioned that, you know, this course this week could play very firm and fast. Well, you know what other course played really firm and fast? Muirfield Village. You know what Denny finished? Second. So actually argue, you could argue he should have won that tournament. But anyway, I just really like how this sets up for Denny. You know that he has a discernible skill, that he is one of the best in the world at, and that is putting. And, and the ball striking components of his game are going pretty good right now also. So I really do think this is a good week for Denny McCarthy. Now, if the ownership on Denny ends up being high, though, I have no problems going back down to Brian Harmon. Brian Harmon in three straight starts, 12th at the Renaissance Club, 9th at Detroit Golf Club, runner-up at TBC Highlands. And when you look at his game, has he gained a lot of strokes in the short game? Yes, but also that's kind of what he does. Like that's kind of where he shows up, you know, at his best is when his short game is, is really good, right? And that good short game translates really well to an open championship venue where the green and regulation percentage might be low. You're going to have to be creative. You're going to have to scramble, right? Now, another thing that I like also is the fact that the T12 at the Renaissance Club, that's another Lynx style test, right? And his record of open championships, he's been really good in the last two. He was T6 at St. Andrews last year, 19th at Royal St. George's the year before. And I'm just willing to kind of ride the fact that he's got that Lynx success Yes, he is not one of the longest hitters off the tee, but I don't think that's going to be a super determining factor of this tournament if, you know, the accuracy is a big issue this week, like a big determining factor this week. Um, And he is one of the more accurate drivers of the golf ball. So I do really like how this sets up for Brian Harmon. I was really surprised to not see him at like 15% projected ownership. Obviously, that could be subject to change, though. Now, the last guy I like at $7,300 is Siwoo Kim. So Siwoo Kim is not coming in with the best of form on paper, but when you look at the ball striking numbers, the ball striking numbers have been really good. It's the putter that's been super hot or cold. Well, let me ask you, what if it's hot? Like we've talked about, poor putters can putt well on these greens in Scotland. And so what if a guy like Siwoo, who's normally a poor putter, has a really good putting week? Siwoo gives you the ball striking upside to win this tournament. I mentioned yesterday um, TPC Sawgrass is one of my comp courses. Guess who's won at TPC Sawgrass? Siwoo Kim. All right. So I really do like Siwoo Kim this week. I like where his game is heading. I like the fact that he can you know, just kind of ball strike his way around. And if the putter is good, Siwoo's going to give you a really, really good week. Now, looking further down the 7K range, Kurt Kitayama, I kind of like a little bit. 
I would have been more encouraged if he was better at the Scottish Open. Alex Noren has really good Open Championship history. Gary Woodland is really striking the ball really well right now, but his Open Championship history is absolute garbage. Um, Chris Kirk is another one that I would look into. Um, just had some solid finishes recently. Um, not really a great Open Championship history, though. All right, now let's dip down into the 6K range. So the first guy I want to talk about in the 6K range is Louis Oosthuizen. So Louis has um, not been great on live, quite frankly. However, he really did turn around the last live tournament, Live London. He finished fourth place at the Centurion Club. Is the Centurion Club a comparable course to Royal Liverpool? No, no, it is not. It is not a Lynx design. It looks like any American country club that you would see in like North Carolina, um, as opposed to like a Lynx style test in Scotland. I can say that because I'm from North Carolina. That's kind of what that tournament looked like. Anyway, Louis Oosthuizen, not been great on live, but I like the fact that he turned it around at the Centurion Club. But Louis is a guy who plays the Open Championship very well. He did miss the cut at St. Andrews last year, but it was all because of his short game. He was third at Royal St. George's the year before that, 20th at Royal Port Rush the year before that, 28th at Carnoustie before that. He's a guy who tends to show well at Open Championships, and I'm not afraid to go to Louis for that reason. The most recent finish at Live London is an encouraging sign to me. Now, the other guy that I got to talk about at 6800 I believe it is. Yes, $6,800. And I think ownership on this guy is going to be really high after his performance at the Scottish Open. That is Robert McIntyre. So if you look at his stat profile, he has been a very good ball striker on the DP World Tour for like the last three or four months. And the putter can be hot or cold. And when it's hot, he gives himself a chance to win, like he almost did at the Renaissance Club, like he did at the DP World Tour's Korean Championship, right? So I really like the fact that all Robert McIntyre seems to need to do is continue his same ball striking and just have the putter stay good like it was last week, and he's going to be all right. He also has a deceptively really good history in Open Championships and in Majors. He's never finished worse than 34th in an Open. And when you look at Majors in general, he missed the cut at Oak Hill this year, but he's – Pretty much made every cut at a major other than that. Has a T6 at Royal Port Rush, has a T8 at Royal St. George's, as well as um, two top 25 finishes at the Masters. So I really do like how everything points to Robert McIntyre this week. My one worry with Robert McIntyre is that I think he might get a little bit chalky, which would lead me to this next guy, Jordan L. Smith, who is the exact same price. So if you Caught the Scottish Open preview last week. Jordan L. Smith, I said that he was the DP World Tour Scotty Scheffler, not because of his results, but because of his profile. He is really, really good at strokes gain T to green, like really good. He's also really, really bad with the putter. But what did you see last week in Renaissance Club? He was almost neutral with the putter. He only lost three-tenths of a stroke on the greens. The ball striking was still there, and he came in 12th in a very tough field, much tougher than the fields he's used to seeing. I'm kind of willing to go with a guy like that who I know is going to strike the ball well and just needs just an average putter to be okay. Uh, I really do like where um, he is at, and I like the fact that he's the same price as Robert McIntyre. If the ownership on Robert McIntyre gets too high, I can just make a very easy pivot to Jordan L. Smith. I, I find it very interesting that he's got the L on his name. It's giving me very big Stephen A. Smith vibes. I kind of like it. Uh, next up on the list that I want to talk about is a guy that is very much a bargain this week, Andrew Putnam. So Andrew Putnam uh, came in 42nd at the Renaissance Club last week and 45th at the Travelers and 43rd at LACC before that. When you look at Andrew Putnam's profile, I've kind of compared, compared him to great value Tom Kim in the past, and I think that's what he's really getting at right now. He is not good off the tee, but he doesn't need to be because he routinely gains multiple strokes on approach. He routinely gains multiple strokes on the greens at a course where accuracy could play a huge factor. Like we talked about on yesterday's episode, the internal OB, the narrow fairways, the nasty rough, accuracy could be a huge factor. And if it is, Andrew Putnam is a guy that can take advantage of that because he is not very long off the tee, but he is accurate. And he does give you a big chance to gain a lot of strokes on approach and with the putter. I do like Andrew Putnam this week. Other guy I want to talk about, same price tag as JT Poston. Also, JT Poston is the absolute value of the tournament on FanDuel. He is a significant misprice. Um, he will be in a lot of my lineups on FanDuel. And why will be, he be in a lot of my lineups? Well, he's got back-to-back sixth-place finishes at the John Deere and at the Renaissance Club. Two totally different golf courses, but if you look at what he done, it was the same formula. He was just 
average in the ball striking categories, but he gained a lot of strokes around the green, a lot of strokes with the putter. And when he plays well, that's kind of what he does. So I know that it's super difficult to rely on a good putter week in, week out, unless they're a good putter like a Denny McCarthy or like a JT Poston. So I'm willing to go back to him for that reason. And, and I think that the recent form is encouraging. And I like the fact that if he can just be – good enough in the ball striking categories, his short game is going to give him an opportunity to contend. Now we got to talk about some deep bargains. All right. So first up is Matthew Jordan. So Matthew Jordan, if you have not heard, you're probably going to hear this about 75 times this week, is a member of Royal Liverpool Golf Club. And I kind of like that course familiarity. Like that's not something you can really put a number behind, but I also like the fact that he's been really good in the ball striking categories on the DP World Tour. He's had some really good finishes on the DP World Tour. At his price tag, he's worth giving a flyer. Now, looking down for some deep bargains, and I mean deep bargains. There's a few guys that I'm willing to go with, and these are the guys that I would be wanting to play like if I'm trying to squeeze Scheffler and Rory in the same lineup or like maybe even like a scheffler Kepka lineup, or maybe even you go with a different build. You go like four 9K guys and then like one of these guys down here. But anyway, if I'm looking to squeeze some guys in, here's the guys that I'm going to be squeezing in. First up is Daniel Hillier. Daniel Hillier, like Matthew Jordan, has been really good on the DP World Tour in the last two or so months. Don't look back further than that because it's not as good. But the last two months have been really good. He's been really good in the ball striking categories. The Scottish Open, he finished 54th, and it was entirely because of his short game. Every other aspect of his game was clicking, um, and I just hope that he can get that putter turned back around, and he's going to be in good shape for the Open Championship. Another one is Richie Ramsey, who kind of like Daniel Hillier, has had a run of really good finishes on the DP World Tour. Came in 42nd at Scotland, was pretty much neutral or better in terms of strokes gain in every category. In a tough field at the Scottish Open, in a tough course at the Renaissance Club. And so I really like what that's done for him. He doesn't have a whole lot of history in major championships, um, but I do just like the fact that his game has been pretty solid at the DP World Tour level, um, and I think that that is going to bode well for him again. Now, Matthew Southgate is the last one that I'm willing to take a flyer on. He is almost at the minimum price tag on DraftKings, and there's two reasons why. One, kind of like what I talked about with Daniel Hillier, the ball striking categories on the DP World Tour have been really good. Um, it's just been the putter that's let him down. He missed the cut at the Scottish Open, which I think will keep people off of him, and it was all because of his putter. He lost five strokes with the putter through two rounds. He's also got really good Open Championship history, though. Okay, maybe not really good in a sense that, like, for like a Rory McIlroy really good, but when you're looking for a bargain, it's really good. He's got a 12th place finish at Royal Troon in 2016, sixth place finish at Royal Birkdale um, a year later, and then a made cut at Carnoustie after that, and this is his first appearance since then. So I'm willing to give that little modicum of Open Championship history a shot when I'm looking down here at the very bottom of the board. All right, so the last thing that we do have to talk about for this week, I do have to talk about one and done. So it is officially like crunch time for one and done seasons. You've only got left the Open Championship, the 3M, the Wyndham, and then you got your two FedEx Cup playoff events. I hope your one and done does not do the Tour Championship. So you need to be figuring out who those five picks are going to be. Keep in mind that the Wyndham and the 3M, you're not going to see a whole lot of guys play. So you're going to get three events where all the big dogs are out. If you need to save one of the big dogs, play one of the live guys. You got Cam Smith, Brooks Kepka, DJ. Um, you got Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, you know those four guys would probably be the four live guys that I would say are at the top. Um, if you want to be in a little more gambly mood, you could roll the dice on a Patrick Reed or a Joaquin Neiman. But I might stick pretty close to the vest if I'm looking to play a live guy. If you're not looking to play a live guy, I'd recommend to play one of like the linksy type specialists. So like a Jordan Spieth, like a Tyrrell Hatton, Tommy Fleetwood, Shane Lowry. I, I don't envision myself wanting to use those guys further down the road. And I think that this is a pretty good spot for him. I think if at all possible, 
I would try to conserve like the top of the top, like a Scheffler or a Rory or a Rom. As much as I think that Scheffler or Rory is going to win this tournament, I wouldn't want to play them in one and done and have them get stuck in a bad weather wave and just have their entire tournament wiped out because they just so happen to be playing in 40 mile an hour winds. That'd be a pretty crappy way to lose one of those guys in one and done. So I think I might be willing to play a little more close to the vest with my pick this week, but I'm probably personally going to be playing the live guys. Um, I played Brooks Kepka in both my one and dones at the PGA championships so i don't have him um i do have cam smith available in one i do have dj and bryson both available in one um so i'm gonna be making my mind up between those guys but i'm trying to save the guys that i have left for the remaining events i know for a fact that i have scotty scheffler left in one of them which makes me very happy um and i know for a fact that i have wyndham clark available in one of them, and then Tom Kim available in both of them. I'm really looking forward to playing Tom Kim um, at the Wyndham Championship. I'm hoping he's returning to defend that title. All right, so that does it for the Open Championship DFS preview. If you like what you saw and you want more content, please hit the like button on YouTube. It really does help me out a lot. If you're listening to the audio form, please rate and review. I cannot express uh, how much it helps me out. I'm very appreciative of it. It really helps me out a lot. Also, hit the subscribe button. Again, not only because it helps me out a lot, but because you'll be notified when new content drops. The first of which will be our Barracuda Championship preview, which we're going to be doing tomorrow. Uh, and then we've got all of our season-long fantasy football content coming out. We have got um, college football and college basketball content coming when it's in season. You hit that subscribe button, you'll be notified when all of it drops. And we will be back next week for the 3M Open on Monday night. You hit that subscribe button, you will be notified. All right, so hopefully... This episode gave you guys enough information that you can identify your favorite plays in DFS, how you're going to build out your lineups. And hopefully you'll be winning big bucks in DFS this week at the Open Championship. I'm hoping I was able to give you guys some good information, some good plays that you can use to do that. If you've made it this far, thank you guys for watching and listening, and I will see you next time.